Um, so uh, thank you uh, to the organisers for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about what we do at Tetra Genetics. So we spend uh, most of our time uh, trying to figure out ways to overcome the obstacles in um, identifying and developing antibodies that uh, target and modulate ion channels. Most of the work we do or that we've done has, um, has focused on developing a system where we can really express a lot of a recombinant protein, which is one of the bottlenecks in the drug discovery side for, for antibody expression. Um, and that helps us uh, mitigate some of the other issues um, just by different strategies, especially uh, overcoming the small epitope space with a lot of the channels, um, different systems that work with different antibody platforms, um, and also strategies involved over mitigating the, the high conservation um, across family members and species. We tend to think of ion channels as, uh, from a recombinant expression uh, standpoint, they're all challenging proteins. Um, in terms of developing antibodies or identifying antibodies, we think there's actually quite a big scale in what's typical and what's a little easier. So um, uh, things like the P2Xs and the A6 that have nice big globular extracellular domains are a little bit easier to find functional antibodies against the voltage-gated ion channels and stuff like the TRIPS that are more planar. Uh, with a plasma membrane surface. I would actually say the voltage-gated ion channels where you have a monomeric alpha pore as opposed to a homotetramer are more difficult still. Um, most of our work, or actually all of our, our platform work, has revolved around tetrahymen of Femophila. This is a, uh, a complex genetic, uh, a, a genetically complex uh, free living eukaryote found in pond water. Um, it uses all those hundreds of cilia per cell um, to find food, evade predators. So it's chemotactic. Um, it's adaptable. It, 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 uh, living in pond water, it's obviously, um, uh, it needs to, to adapt to different uh, states of salinity changes in temperature, um, it's sexual, there is uh, seven mating types. Um, and its ability to, to navigate all of this and to swim around directionally um, really relies on a, a expanded sets of, of membrane transporters and ion channels. And this is really nicely seen when you look at the, gene, uh, the genotype, this is from the uh, the, the genome paper in 2006. Um, for the four major types of membrane transporter families, the ABC uh, transporters, multifacilitator, super family members, voltage gated um, ion channels, and P type ATP aces, tetra tetrahymena roughly encodes three times as many um, of those classes of proteins than do human, um, uh, human cells. So it, it's evolved uh, to produce these kind of proteins. Um, it's a true microbe, despite being uh, genetically complex. It's got, it, uh, it's, it encodes about 20,000 genes. It has two nuclei, a germline diploid nucleus for vegetatively growing cells. It has a macronucleus with about 220 chromosomes, a ploidy of 45. So it's uh, very genetically complex. Uh, we actually developed a system early on to produce vaccine antigens, uh, viral uh, envelope proteins like uh, hemagglutinin, as well as various um, parasitic antigens, uh, eye antigen and a plasmodium antigen, that we could uh, actually direct to different um, uh, uh, membrane compartments. So the hemagglutinin uh, we got to the plasma membrane where it should be, the, I, the immobilization antigen to the ciliary membranes, and this plasmodium antigen, we got the dense core granules, which is uh, essentially a, um, uh, a secreted, uh, 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 an induced secretion system that tetrahymena has. Um, and we could produce these proteins, and they 
produce neutralizing antibodies that were protective in various animal models. So we, we, we felt we had the, you know, the, the basis with uh, tetrahymenate biology to move on to something more challenging like the ion channels. Um, essentially, this is our process. Uh, we developed a vector that we took from the academics that did a, a really elegant job with the, with the genetics. Essentially, it's a, it's a vector that, that contains the complete ribosomal DNA sequence of tetrahymena. We actually shoot it into mating cells. Um, I won't go into the genetic complexity, but essentially um, the RDNA locus gets excised um, and it gets amplified about 9,000 times as a palindrome. So we can get up to about 18,000 copies of the gene per cell. Um, we uh, just grow it in, I mean, you can grow it at 1,500 litres in various bioreactors. We just, whoops, we just grow it in, um, in shake flask, but we spend most of our time here, which is optimizing the expression. Uh, most of the different ion channels require a very specific, specific set of um, expression conditions, and then obviously a lot on the purification and the formulation. And this is typically what we get. This, we spend a lot of the time developing the system for ion channels with the sodium channels, um, and we'd get uh, quite a lot more produced compared to the, you know, the, the standard mammalian systems. Um, this shows you what it kind of takes to, um, to get good expression. These are all different growth conditions. Um, these are things we will add to the media. We'll grow the cells under different conditions. Um, and they're different for each one. So this is, you know, these conditions obviously work well for NAV 1.8. Uh, the same conditions won't work for NAV 1.7 or NAV 1.9. They're all a little bit different. What we really look for, what's a really good sign to us is when the cells start to make it to the plasma membrane. At that point, we know they're not, they, they tend not to be an aggregated mess. Um, and if they get to the plasma membrane, typically we can get them out with detergents and purify them. Um, in terms of formulations, uh, when we started we were really specifically focused on proteoliposomes um, and a, as immunogens. So we could make the, you know, we'd purify the protein, uh, reconstitute it into liposomes with and without either lipid-based adjuvants, TLR agonists. Uh, more recently, and this is kind of information that's come from some of our structural programs, uh, we're really shifting towards amphipole-based preps for, for our immunogens. So we use both of these to either immunize or screen when we get the antibodies. The other big um, prep we use are magnetic beads. Um, or some, it doesn't have to be magnetic beads. Typically, it is. Here is this is where we're trying to orient the channel. So we purify the protein, uh, anchor it to a, some kind of solid support like a bead, then build the lipid bilayer around it to stabilize it. And if it works well, what we're really trying to do here is um, expose the extracellular loops so that these kind of uh, uh, these kind of formulations will specifically pull down surface binders, which is the first type of antibody we have to get if we're looking for, for functional uh, modulators. And so for the amphipoles and the liposomes, we've used them for immunization. Uh, the channel's not oriented in those formulations. We assume it's a 50-50 orientation, but it, it probably depends on the channel. Um, the magnetic beads should be oriented somewhat. It's not perfect. It also depends on how tight the lipid uh, membrane, but uh, some of them work really well. Uh, we use the liposomes and the amphipoles for screening for ELISA. The mag beads are really what we use for phage display. Um, one of the advantages of being able to produce a lot of ion channels is that we can make a lot of counter selection, which is uh, so the same formulation with a closely related ion channel, that can really help getting rid of a lot of the nonspecific antibodies. Um, we can also use the mag beads for flow. Um, you know, for, for analysis, when we first started doing this, we spent a lot of time obviously, once we were purifying the ion channels to make sure that the protein was, was functional. Um, we don't do uh, this 
uh, so much anymore because uh, it's, it's very time consuming. What we'll do now more often is something like this. Uh, this is, for example, uh, one of our current Tripsy 3 preps that we've got into, that is currently in animals. Um, and we'll look at SEC. If we can get S an SEC peak that is not aggregated, um, then we'll, we'll immunize with that. So this is our basic strategy. It's pretty straightforward. Again, we spend quite a bit of time on the expression to make sure we can get enough of the protein. You know, for a typical immunization campaign, you want five or five plus MIGs, or two to five MIGs. Uh, you know, it takes us a lot more than that because we have to develop the formulations, figure out the purification. So uh, the, the bug really has to be expressing the proteins well. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time on formulation and development. Uh, one of the, our strategies is we tend through, if a target's worth going after, it's worth going after in more than one platform. We find some targets do better in, in one platform over another. We try to mitigate the tolerance, so that's kind of like why we like chickens. We like llamas for VHHs. Um, we'll go into rodents, but typically the rodents have to have, to have something special. We don't really care about humanization, we're more interested in something that's mitigated tolerance or if it's a knockout of the, of the target we're going after. And some of the uh, ready-made libraries now, uh, the human libraries are phenomenal, their diversity is huge, um, and they're being developed uh, with um, uh, manufacturing uh, developability downstream uh, 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 always kept in mind when those libraries are made. Obviously, functional screening. I'm going to go into a little bit. You, I think you need to be a little bit careful at this point. Uh, our KV 1.3 is a good example. Um, it took us a while to figure out. Um, I, I think we were actually more lucky than smart with KV 1.3, and I'll talk about that. But typically, it's, it's electrophysiology, obviously. Uh, we tend to go for manual patch uh, because we have very generous collaborators um, and obviously then it has to do something biologically. So let me uh, quickly go into our KV 1.3 program. So it's a, obviously voltage gated potassium channel. It's one of two of the potassium channels that regulates uh, membrane potential, potential in human T cells. So it's a typical uh, the, the alpha subunit is a tetramer of this typical six transmembrane architecture. In autoreactive memory T cells, it's the predominant um, ion, uh, potassium channel, and if you block that channel, it, you can inhibit prolifer proliferation of those diseased affected memory T cells. And it's a validated target for a number of disorder, autoimmune disorders. So if we go through our steps, um, this is an example of our, this is what KV 1.3 looked like when we started. Um, and then, you know, just by adding uh, something to the media, we got it to look like this. KV 1.3 was actually a good uh, protein to start with because there were quite a lot of reagents that had been very well characterized. One of those was uh, various peptide toxins that had already been tagged. And we could tell the cells were making uh, good protein right from the beginning. Uh, because uh, the toxin we were using only recognized the correctly folded uh, tetrama, and uh, we could see that this, uh, the protein was making it to the cell surface. Um, so we figured out a purification protocol. Uh, the protocol actually worked quite well. We got nice, pure protein. That doubled actually uh, both KV 1.3, one of it's a phosphorylated version. There's a little bit of aggregated material, um, but we could show that the, once we reconstituted it into liposomes, um, we could get it to bind ligand, although obviously not at the, not at the uh, affinity of the native KV 1.3. I think it was about 100-fold less, uh, but certainly um, well within the bounds of, of moving forward um, with the antibody program. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we went into two animals. We went into chickens with, with ligand pharmaceuticals, who was formerly Crystal Biosciences. Um, we did the screening. Uh, uh, they have a, a wonderful B-cell cloning um, screening technology called GEM. 
And here we, we screened individual B cells with a number of formulations, including the cells themselves, and KV1.3 adhered to polystyrene beads and magnetic beads. Um, for the llamas, uh, the llamas, we uh, did that work in collaboration with Arginex. Um, here, the, the animals actually immunized. The primary immunization was DNA. It was boosted with a protein. They made libraries, um, and then we went after the libraries with the magnetic beads. Um, and this just shows you a handful of the antibodies that were specific for KV1.3 over an irrelevant um, ion channel. So we ended up uh, screening all of those specific antibodies um, by uh, manual patch. And the program summary is essentially out of the 69 sequence unique uh, clones that we had, uh, we got nine functional blockers from the chickens and one from the llama. Um, and the potencies uh, uh, were really quite good. They were sub nanomolar for about three or four of them. So they were uh, certainly worth going after with further development. So we identified a lead. Uh, it was a chicken antibody that we needed to humanize. Um, so one of the interesting, oh, actually before I get to that, we wanted to make sure that it was actually had a, a biological effect. And so uh, on human CD4 cells that were uh, stimulated with uh, CD3, we got nice uh, inhibition uh, compared to the prototype uh, KV1.3 uh, uh, peptide inhibitor SHK and the concomitant uh, decrease in interferon gamma production. So um, we picked our lead, uh, we went forward with the humanization, um, and we did actually, you know, as the antibody was being humanized, we were chasing it by electrophysiology, um, getting really nice, consistent dose response curve. We were using, at this point, we had changed cell line. We, we were using a commercially available CHO KV1.3 cell line. Uh, but what we, we, we found, oh, it didn't come up here, is that we were not, it, and this actually came up pretty late in the game, um, we discovered we actually couldn't detect binding of the antibody to this cell line by flow, which made no sense because um, this cell line was producing thousands of copies of the KV1.3. So we thought there may be an answer in the mechanism of action of the antibody. So we started looking at that. And what we found pretty uh, uh, immediately was that the antibody, if we ran these different protocols, did not bind the resting state of the channel. Um, it actually really didn't show any block when we did the voltage step protocol um, with infrequent intervals at 60 seconds. And then we started to get activation when we increased the, the frequency of the steps from 30 seconds and certainly at 20 seconds. So it, it, it indicated that the, the antibody was uh, use dependent. So we went and looked at this a little bit further and found that um, when we pushed the channel um, into the inactivated state, we weren't getting any block there, presumably no binding. Um, and then as soon as we returned to the 30 second interval, um, we were getting the nice uh, block that we had seen previously. So when you put all this together, um, the antibody seems to be state dependent um, and it seems to be an, uh, associated with an open, uh, a block of an open state of a channel. What was really interesting and we hope uh, physiologically relevant, as we were doing this and we were seeing if we could get the antibody to bind to different cell types, we tried it on chronically uh, re-stimulated human T cells. So these are human T cells that have been uh, re-stimulated with the antigen specifically over 10 times. Uh, and this is, uh, this basically um, is a surrogate for uh, your autoimmune uh, chronically reactivated um, uh, auto, uh, affected memory T cells. And in this case, we got really nice binding uh, with our antibody. Um, and not only did we get nice binding, when we stimulated the cells with peptide in various concentrations, we got a nice decrease in proliferation as well. 
Um, so we still don't have an answer as to why the antibody binds these cells. I mean, these are our uh, disease target cells, so this is great. Um, it, my first inkling was that, uh, you know, the, the, this is native KV1.3 that's complex with beta subunits and, and everything else. The Cho KV1.3 are just the alpha subunit. Um, but actually, one of our collaborators said, no, these, these uh, chronically reactivated stem cells, uh, T cells, excuse me, um, are actually probably cycling through the different states of a channel. Uh, so this is probably more having to do with the use dependence we saw um, than, than the channel just exposing the epitope because it's in its native state. Okay, just quickly, uh, the other channel on T cells that regulates membrane potential is a calcium activated potassium channel, KCA 3.1. It's, exp it's actually expressed on a bunch of different uh, cells. Again, it's a, it's a tetramer of a, of a six transmembrane monomer. It's a little bit more complicated. It has cow, cow modulin domain that uh, regulates the calcium activation of the channel. And it's also implicated in a number, number of diseases autoimmune fibrosis, as well as a couple of anemias, um, such as sickle cell and hereditary xerocytosis. Uh, hereditary xerocytosis is associated, or some of those cases are actually associated with gain-of-function mutations for KCA 3.1. In this case, uh, again, you know, this is what the tetrahymena looks like when it expresses KCA 3.1. Uh, that's basically all the QC we had to see for this. Um, we purified it, uh, stuck it on mag beads, and um, used a, a five to 10 molar excess of KV1.3 in the liposomes, and we, we screened ModiQuest's phage library. So they have human naive uh, library and a human patient library. We use KV1.3, the, the liposomes for counter selection, um, and the, the screen actually worked quite nominally. Uh, we got nice polyclonal response. The monoclonal response uh, was 45% specific for KCA 3.1. Uh, out of those, we, we found 34 sequence unique clones, which were all screened for functionality. Two of them turned out to be functional. Um, one of them with an IC50 of around two nanomolar which we thought was uh, 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 worthy of um, further consideration in terms of its biology. And so far, we've only looked at, uh, so uh, KCA 3.1 inhibitors have been previously shown to block proliferation of a cancer cell line. And so far, the antibody's performing quite well and doing the same thing. Um, so just in summary, uh, the tetrahymena is really a complex organism. It's got interesting but tractable, tractable uh, genetics. Um, it's a true microbe, uh, so it has all those speed advantages. Uh, the expression is large. Um, and you know, this robust expression really allows us to spend time figuring out how to purify them, how to formulate them for the different screens. And I think if, you, if you're just smart in how you um, go about your discovery strategy, the different formulations, the different platforms, what you're screening against, um, then uh, you can really turn this into a bit of a production line. And that's what we've done. Now we've got, I think we've, we've got five current programs that are all producing antibodies. Okay, so. These are our guys. Uh, that's us, except we're a lot more than this now. Our special thanks to the uh, High and Heike out of Davis, who are our, our potassium channel experts and did a lot of the screening um, uh, to actually identify the, uh, the antibodies. Our uh, uh, antibody platform partners at Ligon and Arginex as well. Um, and LIFARC in the UK who actually did the humanization of the antibody. And thank you. Thanks. 
So some of the benefits from the drugs that are normally um, used for um, the hematological, even malignancies or the one that you listen to them, they rely on the fact that they are reversible. So the drugs have a reverse, the, the effect of the drug can be reversed. They shut down the disease cell, cell mm -hmm. and have a limited impact on the normal cell. Mm -hmm. But now with an antibody, that seems to be a little bit more dramatic. Have you done any in vivo experiment to see any other side effects? We haven't, uh, we haven't yet, that's, that's planned. But for KV 1.3, that's our most advanced program. Um, we're just about to start preclinical uh, studies with that. And everything else, we're, we're really focused on discovery. I mean, there's an opportunity for us to find a lot of antibodies. And so we're really focused on in vitro at the moment. Um, but yes, that's, that's definitely in the plans. We just, we just, we're just not there yet. A question uh, here. Great talk, Paul. Thanks. Um, a big challenge in antibody generation for ion channels is, you know, the time course of inhibition mm -hmm. by patch clamping, and can you see it in the time course of an experiment? Oh, yeah. How long did it take for yours to block it, currents for 1.3 and, and 3.1? So for, for 1.3, we have a, and it can depend a little bit on the cell, but it's 10 minutes after addition. Is that right, Yee? About 10 minutes? Yeah. So we, we've actually had other people look at the channel and say it's not active because they ran it for five minutes. And then we, you know, and then we said, well, run it for 15 minutes. So it's, but it's one of the things you have to be worried about because the potassium channels are okay, but as you know, you, voltage run down, you've got to make sure that you're actually seeing an, an effect and not just a, you know, a, a restriction of a, of a patch. Um, but we constantly see um, for the antibody, it's about, it, it starts at about 10, 12 minutes and then it takes maybe another 10 minutes to, to you know, block as much as it's going to block at a given concentration. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Bruce, question. Do you know whether the antibody is physically, uh, is physically occluding the pore? or whether it's somehow causing a conformational change in the we, gene? We don't. We have a structure program that would, that actually, uh, we have KV 1.3 at a collaborators. We're just about to give him the antibody to hopefully find that. I, I would guess it's probably a steric thing, um, but I, I, we don't know. Maybe I, I can ask a quick question before we go for lunch. Mm -hmm. it, 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 I can see how that's very be beneficial for conditions of cancer that maybe is in the blood. But what about um, trying to target the heart or more tricky, perhaps, in the brain? So uh, these yeah, so that cross the blood-brain barrier? Or? Right. So um, we don't focus on CNS because we're focused on antibodies. But, the you know... You know, crossing the blood-brain barrier is its own industry, and there's a lot going on there. And I think people are looking at immunoglobulins, maybe the smaller ones, the VHHs, okay. uh, to, to, to do that. For the heart, we're not really looking at... Um, I think uh, for... We, we may... Uh, for KCA 3.1, actually, like restenosis um, uh, is, is an indication we may look at. Um, but mostly it's, it's autoimmune. We're starting to look at oncology now, not through channels, but through uh, true transporters. Right. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. If there's no more questions, maybe we can just thank Paul and all the other speakers in this session for a, for a great series of talks. Thanks again. Thanks. So I'm not sure if Duncan's going to make an announcement, but I think we're going to go for lunch and it's